This is Hidden Killers Week in Review. A look back at the most prolific stories of the week. This is the Hidden Killers Podcast with Tony Bruski. Featuring defense attorney, Hidden Killers daily contributor, and host of the Defense Diaries podcast, Bob Motta. Let's talk about the gun, though, too, because the, the only side that's had a chance to really examine that gun and say, oh, it was in working order, it was perfect. Now, any gun, which I think is a ridiculous argument of like, well, it was in working order. Any gun can misfire. Any gun can have an issue at any time. There are things that go wrong, especially if you're cocking the, the hammer on the gun. Things can go wrong. They're never completely foolproof, which is why you don't aim it at somebody. But again, we're talking about a movie here. The defense never got a chance to look at the damn gun or have their, their experts look at the gun, only the prosecution. And in doing so, destroyed the gun, which that it's, that is just kind of mind-blowing uh, on all of this. Not saying it's a conspiracy, maybe gross negligence, I don't know. But it's very bizarre to me that you go and literally take a hammer to the gun and destroy it without having both sides have a chance to look at it intact. Yeah. Th that, that just doesn't make any sense. Uh, and, and, and there's no reason to even do the test that they did like that on the gun. It wasn't dropped. It wasn't thrown. It wasn't handled in some way that would require it to be hammered. Um, I don't even quite know what the point of that test is. Um, I'm sure there's something, but it's beyond me. But to destroy it and never have a chance for this key piece of evidence and have the defense take a look at it and, again, have their experts look at it, too. Nope, can't do that anymore because it's gone. What is that? Yeah, it's crazy. And, uh, you know, I mean, that was kind of like the 11th hour motion that the defense filed. They filed a motion to dismiss the matter based on that, yeah. based on spoilation of evidence um, during the testing. And, you know, the judge denied it. Um, she, she didn't find that it was, uh, of, of such a degree that it was going to affect their ability to be able to, to defend the case. Like, I, like to be honest with you, the kind of the way that the judge was ruling on a lot of those motions and eliminate, including the, the motion to dismiss, I would have seriously considered potentially going bench trial with this. Yeah. Just like I, I got a much different vibe from her. And she was the same judge that was on Hannah Gutierrez, who was convicted mm -hmm. and was sentenced to 18 months, which is the, which is the max. Um, she just had a, a very different approach with respect to the two different defendants in terms of kind of like how I thought she was viewing the case. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So I think with Baldwin, um, you know, I, I was getting a sense that, you know, because she was she was carving out some some rulings that I thought really favored the defense in those motions. And like, I, I seriously would have considered going to Baldwin and like, you know, maybe we should waive jury and go with the judge on this one, mm -hmm. which is always risky. Yeah. You know, you're trying to read minds and it's, we can't read minds mm -hmm. at, least, sure. at least that I know of. Not and yet. That's, that's next year with AI. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, but like with her, uh, I, I was just getting that sense that it might have been a move, you know, mm -hmm. because, again, if you get some gun owners on that jury who are just that's that, that live and die by gun safety rules, I, I, I could see a world in which they're going to hold Baldwin accountable, period. They don't care. They're not going to care that he's on a movie set. Yeah. You know, they're going to find that he was liable, that it was his responsibility He as the as the final person that had the gun in his hands, that it was his responsibility to, to check and to make sure, you know, whether that means he, you know, fire pulls the trigger into the ground, you know, while he's got the weapon trained at the ground four or five times to make sure that these things are mm -hmm. not going to fire or whatever, yeah. you know, but he didn't do any of that, you know, and then we're going to get into the evidence yeah. that in this particular scene, which they were just like blocking the shot, mm -hmm. like they were just setting up the shot for when it was going to, to go live and they were going to actually film it. You know, that's where you saw yesterday during the, which I thought was pretty interesting because they showed some of the raw footage yeah. you know, from it where he's pulling the gun out, you know, like yeah, they showed three or four times, um, you know, and, and it, it's one of those things where he wasn't supposed to pull the trigger during the scene, mm -hmm. anyway, which again, you, you know, you've got these conflicting statements by Baldwin that he didn't pull the trigger. Now, I don't know if you've watched any of the, the, hearing today or the trial today but apparently there was some note 
um, about the gun that they found like on that cart that was relating to um, that they, that the, that the hammer wasn't sticking anymore. <laughs> so I like, it seemed like it could be a very helpful note to the defense. Yeah. If they're going to kind of proceed with this concept that Baldwin didn't actually pull the trigger Yeah, that he, he cocked the weapon and somehow a discharge. Cause you know, according to the testing, which obviously the defense per your point that we were just talking about, not didn't really get to test it with their own experts. You know, the, the, they were saying, no, that's not possible. We, we did it hundreds of times and it never discharged. And then um, let's destroy the gun. <laughs> I, yeah. And then, then we just destroyed it completely. So good luck. Good yeah. luck with that. And it, I mean, you look at it too, because I mean, again, I'm not saying there's a conspiracy here, but it kind of looks like, like someone doesn't like Alec Baldwin and let's destroy the gun. So they can't uh, argue this or have their expert look at him and go, yeah, this could, this could be an issue. Um, right. may, I don't know. Maybe he's a very polarizing figure. There could be some of that, which I think is going to play more in the hands of the jury of their view of Alec Baldwin already. But um, it, it, it's just again, it's just kind of like in conflicting arguments on both hands that that make sense. Let's take a look now at some of those uh, opening uh, statements here. This is uh, Alex Spiro, the defense of Alec Baldwin, uh, doing just that. May I proceed? Thank you. Your Honor. Good morning. This was an unspeakable tragedy, but Alec Baldwin committed no crime. He was an actor acting, playing the role of Harlan Rust. An actor playing a character can act in ways that are lethal, that just aren't lethal on a movie set. These cardinal rules, they're not cardinal rules on a movie set. And I don't have to tell you much more about this because you've all seen gunfights in movies. And the reason that can happen is because safety is ensured before the actor. On this movie set, there were people responsible for ensuring the safety of the set and the firearm. Those people failed in their duties, but Alec Baldwin committed no crime. The most critical issue in this case is how a real bullet got on a movie set. The evidence will show that real bullets are never supposed to be on movie sets. Movie sets use dummies and blanks. Movie sets use dummies, fake inert bullets that look like real bullets, they don't go bang, for when you want a close-up of the gun. You can't tell them apart from live bullets by looking at them, which is why live bullets can be nowhere near a movie set. And if the director wants a shot of the gun going, you know, bang poof, there's blanks that they can use, and those blanks look nothing like real bullets, and they um, are used for those shooting scenes. I think you laid it out pretty clear there. It's a matter of, you know, the jury going to remember this is probably something that's going to be need to be reiterated as it gets closer to uh, time to make a verdict. Yeah. And he, he, a couple of times during his opening statement, he did slip into argument. And, it, you know, if, if our viewers don't know, um, you know, opening statements are not for argument. That's mm -hmm. essentially where you're laying, like laying out the, the roadmap for the jury as to what, they can expect to see during the course of the trial. That's why you always hear yeah. the lawyers saying, and, and you'll hear and you'll see evidence. You know, they always use those it's all kind of like a closing argument, <laughs> right? I mean, and, and that's like typically it's frowned upon between lawyers to to object during opening and closings, mm -hmm. but they objected a few times because he did slip a bit into argument. Um, but those are certainly things that they will be bringing up during the course of the trial with their with their experts. Um, and then they'll reiterate it during closing arguments. They'll drive that home. Um, but yeah, I mean, like ultimately it's going to boil down to that. Right. I, I mean, but like you were saying, I mean, there, there's so many dynamics at play with this trial because of who Alec Baldwin is. Mm -hmm. I mean, not only is he, you know, famous, you know, like, I mean, virtually everybody knows who he is. Virtually everybody's mm -hmm. seen his work as an actor, but he's also very polarizing because mm -hmm. he's very political, you know? And if you get anybody who's pro Trump on that jury, Alec Baldwin's in deep, deep, deep trouble. You know what I'm saying? Cause yeah. they, they just like, like, you would hope that a juror would be able to put that aside because that's not a part of the equation in terms of mm -hmm. evaluating a case as a juror and reaching a decision that affects somebody's life. You can't bring your, your biases in uh, and, and allow that to affect the way that you're going to ultimately decide on a case as a juror. But I mean, is that reality? 
No. People are people. <laughs> yeah. They're, people, they're, are, people are people, you know? So, I mean, that is certainly a factor in there. And they, and they really buzzed through, uh, uh, Ward Iyer, you know, I mean, it was like, it was quick. They got yeah. like, I was surprised that they were able to, uh, get the jury picked in one day, yeah. you know, like, because the, just that whole factor of it being Alec Baldwin, you know, does yeah. that, how does that impact jurors? You know, are they a little starstruck? Are they not like, what, like, how does that work? You know? So, but I mean, ultimately we'll find out if, if this jury will come back with a verdict. Want to listen ad free? Want advanced access to all of our interviews before anyone else? Become a True Crime Today Premium Plus subscriber on Apple Podcasts. You get every episode commercial free. So you can binge on True Crime. Until you can binge no more. Search True Crime Today Premium Plus on Apple Podcasts now. Or go to our podcast page and sign up now. More of the Hidden Killers podcast next.